Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue à cette quatrième conférence du cycle « Les écritures dans les mondes anciens 2 » de Villaral, Institut des langues rares de l'École pratique des hautes études PSL. Comme chaque fois, je vous prierai de bien vouloir éteindre vos micros pendant la présentation. Et après la présentation, vous pourrez poser vos questions, soit en levant la petite main jaune, en bas à droite dans les actions de Zoom, en principe, soit en écrivant vos questions dans le chat. Aujourd'hui, j'ai le plaisir d'introduire notre conférencière, Mme Annick Payne, qui nous parlera de l'écriture hiéroglyphique anatolienne, de sa découverte, de sa structure, de son développement historique et de ses relations à d'autres écritures, ainsi que de ses fonctions de communication. Nous aurons ainsi l'occasion de découvrir une troisième tradition hiéroglyphique après l'Égypte et le monde maya. Annick Payne est, pour l'instant encore, chercheuse à l'Institut des sciences archéologiques de l'Université de Berne, en Suisse, mais sera dès l'automne professeur en langues anatoliennes à l'Université K. Foscari de Venise. Sa recherche porte sur les langues et systèmes d'écriture de l'Anatolie ancienne, en particulier les hiéroglyphes anatoliens et les écritures alphabétiques anatoliennes. Elle est épigraphiste avec les fouilles de Circle Huyuk et Adana Tepebay. Parmi ses livres, Hieroglyphic Luvian Texts in Translation, Hieroglyphic Luvian An Introduction with Original Texts et Schrift und Schriftlichkeit, die anatolischen Hieroglyphenschrift. À Venise, Madame Payne dirigera également un projet européen de très grande ampleur, IRC, intitulé Communication in Anatolia, avec un focus sur les Lydiens, les Phrygiens et les Louvites, toute population de l'Anatolie au premier millénaire avant notre ère, et abordant des questions comme l'autoprésentation et la communication à travers les monuments inscrits ou la perception par l'extérieur dans un vaste espace multilingue. Aujourd'hui, exceptionnellement, la conférence sera donnée en anglais, mais vous pourrez naturellement poser vos questions en français si vous le souhaitez, et je me ferai votre traducteur. Uh, Annick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, I promise to talk about the rise and fall of the Anatolian hieroglyphic script, and that is something I will do, I have to say, only partially, because I figured most of you probably know little to nothing about this particular writing system. So what I'm going to try to do is reach this uh, chronological scope while at the same time giving you a introduction and an overview of uh, many different aspects that certainly I find very exciting. So we shall, oh, so yeah, it's moving now. So uh, I'll start with a quick overview of sort of what is it we're going to be looking at today. So firstly, where are we in time and place? Um, you've got a map here that shows you modern Anatolia and uh, basically the red dots and the green dots are fine spots of hieroglyphic inscriptions. The red ones mark early inscription basically up until 1200 BC. So that's the period that we call the Bronze Age. The green ones mark uh, Iron Age, so later 1200 to about 700 BC inscription. So you see there's, there's a certain shift more towards the east and uh, into northern Syria for later inscriptions. Um, and we'll be coming back a little bit to this sort of divide between the two periods. So the script itself is actually a local Anatolian writing system. Um, there is every evidence that it was developed in Anatolia itself. Um, it came into being as the second writing system in use by the Hittite Empire. The Hittite Empire uh, used a cuneiform, so um, little wedge signs on clay tablets. That was at the time the international script that was used by quite a few different uh, principalities and uh, the Hittites for whatever reason decided they also needed another writing system that they used internally and mainly on monuments. After the end of the Bronze Age 1200 BC um, the Hittite Empire is gone and uh, replaced by various successor states, which we call Neo-Hittite. And they also adopt this script. What we don't have from any of these regions at this later period is anything written in cuneiform. 
So the question is, do they only write in hieroglyphs? It very much looks like that. The script itself is exclusively used to write the Luwian language. So Luwian, if you haven't heard of it before, is one of the Indo-European languages. And if we uh, use this tree model, so you have Indo-European languages that branch into quite a few different branches. One of them is the Anatolian branch. And there we have, uh, again, further differentiations. We have on the one side Hittite that I've already mentioned from the Hittite Empire. This is one of the other languages that they write in cuneiform. There's Palaic, and then there is another subgroup called Luwik, of which Luwian is one of the languages that we have. We have it actually also on clay tablets in cuneiform, and we have it on mainly monuments in the Anatolian hieroglyphic script, and that is what we're going to be looking at tonight. Also, Luwin is actually attested to a level where we know they had several different dialects that were also encoded in writing. So it's, it's quite an interesting area to study as well, linguistically. And so the text corpus that we have is mainly one that uh, is preserved on very durable material, namely stone. We have some uh, smaller number of uh, examples on metal or also some scribbles on clay. We assume that the script would have been used on other materials that haven't been preserved because what we can tell from looking at these durable stone monuments is that there is, for instance, quite a movement of uh, where, where, where the signs develop into more cursive sign forms. Clearly, that is not the obvious thing to happen when you're carving it into stone. It's much more likely that this is part of a sort of handwriting process. Handwriting is almost not preserved. I will show you an example later that we do have. Um, one of the effects of having very much this particular type of the tradition preserved, but other bits not, um, is that uh, we're limited in terms of the text genres that we have. So a large amount of the text that we do have are building and commemorative inscriptions. We have dedications. And then all of the other items that I've listed here we have in really just, uh, well, the deeds, records, contracts, and the letters. We have a few examples of all of those. We do have, again, a larger number of epigraphs. I will be showing you some as well. And we also have several nice corpora with seals. Now, I'd like to just give you a brief uh, yeah, impression really of what there is. So this is just to give you an idea. We find the script on relief uh, depictions. You see here on the very left, a storm god figure and his name is given in hieroglyphs above his uh, hand. Um, we also have, for instance, statues, like you see this very nice looking gentleman in the middle. Um, and he carries the inscription on his back, which I think is really quite adorable. But we don't just have it on human figures. We also have it, for instance, on portal lions. They can be uh, adorned with written text. And uh, so th there's quite a combination between art, architecture and writing which of course um, one could also argue makes a lot of sense because the writing itself is pictorial. What we also have are rock faces that are just part of the natural rock formations in um, the region. And there we have anything from what you see at the bottom, a relief depiction with kings. And uh, so on the left, you have the Hittite uh, great king and his personal god, and on the right, his wife and her personal goddess. And again, these uh, figures are identified by writing. Uh, the other example at the top, um, that's a much longer inscription. So there's quite a scope of different types of writing on rock faces as well. 
Then we have things like graffiti that occur in various places, uh, particularly in the capital city of Hattusha during the Bronze Age. Here we have something that very much looks like a sign announcing the services of two scribes. And uh, so this is an uh, imaginary drawing um, by someone who might uh, catch the spirit of how that could have been. So we assume there were public scribes that you could hire, for instance, to write letters for you. Um, then we have a range of portable objects, obviously given the materiality, um, we don't have as much of these as we have uh, rock faces or sculptural stone elements. Um, we know that uh, in the Hittite Empire, at least, uh, they would write on wooden tablets. And you see here an example that comes from uh, Copts in Egypt. And uh, But something similar to this might have been around. We would not expect it to survive the millennia in the climate that we have in Anatolia. And you see here a silver stag, it's a kind of ritual drinking vessel and uh, at the top of the rim there it, it's got this sort of pictorial scene and again things are explained with hieroglyphic writing. Other examples that we have here, um, we have a small collection of lead strips. Uh, you see one here on the top left. Um, it's uh, quite badly corroded in parts and you see a bit at the top here is broken off as well. Uh, the, the beauty of this writing material is it's very pliable and you can very nicely write. And this very much is what we have in terms of real handwriting from antiquity. And you could then, they were originally rolled up, uh, like shown in this little drawing here. And then you could, for instance, put them around a string or so, wear them around your neck to transport them. For instance, that's how we imagine they might have done it. Uh, we also see occasional instances actually uh, on clay tablets. You see here on the right bottom, what looks for, at first glance like a usual cuneiform tablet and on the left you have here a sort of drawing of a lion and that's quite a playful way of the scribe of this particular tablet to write his name namely in hieroglyphs so that's kind of a first impression of uh, the materials we're dealing with I now want to take you on a journey to look at the discovery and the decipherment of the script so the, the earliest uh, reference to this particular writing system comes actually from Herodotus. Um, um, we can locate the uh, inscription, it still exists today. It's on a road uh, connecting basically Izmir to Ephesus. And uh, so Herodotus, talks about seeing this monument and uh, he also very confidently reads the what he thinks Egyptian hieroglyphs and says I've won this country with my shoulders. Now we know the inscription that is not at all what it says and it's also clearly not Egyptian so for that reason Herodotus uh, is not credited with having rediscovered this particular writing system and the culture that relates to it. Rather, um, the story starts with uh, Borkhardt, who was a Swiss Orientalist uh, who traveled very widely in the ancient Near East. And uh, in his travels in Syria, he came across some stones that were built into a house and um, he quite correctly identified this is a writing system that's kind of a bit like Egyptian, seems to be hieroglyphic, but it is actually not Egyptian. That was quite correct. At the time when he discovered this, people really knew nothing about the language and or the people behind this. So the story then continues relatively quickly with Archibald Henry Says, who was a British scholar of the ancient Near East and uh, the Bible. He connected these stones from Hamar with the Hittites. Now for him, the Hittites were people he knew from the Bible. So a few smaller unimportant stems. At this time, the 
real civilization that we now connect with the Hittite Empire hadn't been rediscovered yet. So the beginning actually of Hittiteology is these hieroglyphs. So uh, Says already correctly identified a few signs in the coming years. Um, so you see this little figure that points at himself. That's the sign for I or I am. Uh, and the other one is the sign for God. He also identified that correctly. Then uh, Leopold Messerschmidt uh, was the first person who started to collect these uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions to have a corpus of them. Um, so in 1900, he published his first volume, and then there were two supplements to this uh, with revisions. And uh, you can see from this that within just a few years, there was an increase in inscriptions, but in comparison, almost 100 years later, um, there are quite a few more major inscriptions, plus, and this is very gratifying, there's still new inscriptions being found. Uh, I would uh, estimate at about two a year at the moment. And that's really quite something, especially if you're thinking about, we're talking huge monuments. We're not talking two tablets a year. We're talking two big stone elements or so. Um, now, to be able to decipher this writing system, you needed the cultural background, you needed some linguistic background. Ideally, of course, you wanted a Rosetta Stone. So um, let's sort of quickly move a little bit sideways and look at the decipherment of Hittite. Now, the capital city of the Hittites, Hattusa, was uh, visited already in 1843 by Charles Texier, but he thought it was uh, the ancient city of Teria. Now, uh, Says, actually, who we met just a few slides ago, uh, he already connected the Hammer inscriptions with the Hittite civilization. And a few years later, there was a first book written by William Wright on the empire of the Hittites, and that included some early readings of these hieroglyphic inscriptions by Says. Now, at the time, obviously, that was a bit ambitious without really having penetrated the uh, script yet. Now, the next important part is that actually uh, Egyptian excavations in Tel El Amarna uh, discovered some references to a mighty kingdom of Keta, so the Hittites. Um, that was the first idea that the Hittites were maybe not the unimportant uh, peoples from the Bible. Um, excavations at Boasco or ancient Hattusha uh, in 1906 uh, got uh, very nicely underway with uh, an initial discovery of 2,500 clay tablets and tablet fragments. So very much at the beginning, you had all of the written material already or a lot of it. Uh, and from that started the decipherment of the Hittite language if you remember the initial slide with the language tree, Hittite is relatively closely related to Luwian. So this gives us the background that was needed to make any serious inroads with deciphering the Luwian inscriptions. Now, ideally, of course, a Rosetta Stone would have been nice. Instead, what we got was the Tarkon Demos seal and uh, it's a beautiful object, uh, but the reading both of the cuneiform outer rim uh, and through that of the hieroglyphs has been troublesome and it's taken a very long time to get to the correct reading, which hasn't been achieved until uh, 1998, despite the fact that this object has been known for more than 100 years before that. So that was not the Rosetta Stone. Instead, we do have several bilingual inscriptions, and in particular, there is a very large inscription from the site of Karatepe, where there is a huge uh, fortress with two uh, city gates that go into the fortified area. And on both sides, there are very long inscriptions in both Luwian and Phoenician, so Phoenician in alphabetic writing and Luwian in this Anatolian hieroglyphic script. Um, and they're even relatively close in uh, correspondence. So it's, it's, it's a very good bilingual. 
um, comes again with uh, a few problems. The first one is that uh, it wasn't discovered until 1946. So by that time, um, hieroglyphic inscription had been known for about three quarters of a century. Uh, and then uh, it took a very long time for the first uh, edition to be published. That wasn't published until 1999. So, um, this text was used to correct earlier readings of the script and was successfully used for it. Uh, it wasn't uh, available necessarily as early as one would have wished. Um, there are a few other multilingual inscriptions. Um, there are some uh, vessels, clay vessels, pitoy, uh, which can uh, preserve some measurements in Euratian and uh, Luwian. Then uh, there is a trilingual and uh, or there are even two trilinguals, but um, they have their own problems. The Chinoko bilingual is actually very close again to Karatepe, almost, um, well, depending on the dating, it's either a copy or, an ins or it's inspired by, uh, so it's e either the model for or it's inspired by Karatepe. Um, and of course, we do have uh, quite a few seals, especially the royal seals that uh, have um, cuneiform with uh, hieroglyphic legends. So those are, if you want, mini bilinguals, evidently limited, but um, they also contribute something. So now I would like to now look a little bit at how does the script work? And then also how has it developed? So these this is really two areas that interconnect. So we're going to be jumping a little bit from one to the other and back. Um, just a few words on how we actually transliterate the script. Um, so we have signs that have either a semantic value or a phonetic value or both. What they don't do is they don't have six or seven values. Um, so if, if they have a semantic value, um, we differentiate between logograms and classifiers, but in transliteration is actually not a huge difference. We uh, transcribe these in capital letters uh, by using the Latin word of what is depicted. So if it shows a hand, it's manus, for instance. Um, obviously, we can only do that if we understand what's being depicted. If we don't understand that, then we would simply use the number from the sign list. And if we interpret this sign as being a classifier, then we will put it in brackets. Now, if we have a phonetic value, then that's just written in uh, minuscules. And um, we do have homophone signs, so not one sign having several values, but several different signs having the same value. So we need to differentiate between the signs. The most common one is our number one, and then two, three, et cetera. And uh, as in the transcription of uh, cuneiform, we use the uh, acute and the gravis for number two and three, and then we go down to index numbers. What we do do is if we're uncertain of a phonetic value, then we might just put the phonetic value with an X. So it's a suggestion um, and either we can prove it one day or not. Um, so if one finds a value with an X, um, that is actually from going back from the transliteration to the original sign value. That's not necessarily every time the same sign because uh, research moves on. So if we look at uh, the types of signs we have and the functions they fulfill, so the, the big divide is between are we using a sign to indicate a semantic value or a phonetic value? And amongst the semantic value, so if we have a logogram, that just means a word is being written by one sign that represents it. And uh, as a reader of the script, we would expect to read this sign in the original language. Now, as modern readers of a very ancient system, we sometimes can't do that, but uh, the original readers would have done that. In contrast to this, if we have a classifier, then um, this is actually just a reading aid maybe. It tells us 
the semantic register that's being employed, um, but it would not have been read. It's just there to guide us through the reading process. So you have two examples here at the bottom. I've just taken this uh, hand sign. So it's the taking hand, kapara. Uh, if I use that as a logogram, then it could uh, stand for any and all of the forms derived from the stem la, to take. Um, if I use it as a classifier, I can, for instance, use it as a classifier for upaha. I found it. There is a similar sounding word that has a different uh, semantic register, which actually is then classified with a different classifier. So it helps us uh, disambiguate writings. And then, of course, we have phonetic values. Um, they are very much limited to consonant vowel signs and vowel signs. The consonant vowel signs sometimes get extended uh, in their length. And then there are very few instances that break with this structure. So consonant, vowel consonant or vowel consonant. Uh, interestingly enough as well, these uh, tend to be used earlier rather than uh, later. And they certainly do not develop new signs of this structure in the later period. So um, it leaves the impression that uh, they were aware that one could be doing different things and they then chose to keep it simple. It means actually as well, uh, when you're thinking about Indo-European languages, one of the features that they have is they're prone to consonant clusters. For instance, think of the English word street, S-T-R, at the beginning of a word. How do you write that when you have consonant vowel signs? <laughs> you end up with quite a few vowels that you don't need. So when reading this language, uh, we're faced with some superfluous vowels. Generally, they use the A series for this. So I want to show you as well what we understand about how they got to give values to their signs. So if we look at semantic values first, there are quite a few different ways of getting to a value that we know. There may have been more that we don't know about. There are certainly signs where we don't know how they got the value because they're if nothing else, quite a few signs as well, where we're just not sure what it is exactly that they depict. Um, so the, the most simple form is that you just depict and you show uh, what you mean. So here you have a hand, is a hand, is a hand. Um, if you compare that with one of the slides before, uh, you already know we have not just one hand, we have different hands. So, uh, and, and there are other ways of uh, playing with this. So, um, for instance, here you have the sign that we've already seen as well of the person pointing at himself, I. To do that, you could draw the entire figure, and, and we actually have variants that do that as well. But in the end, it's enough to uh, draw the bit that's really salient for understanding the meaning. So you can reduce... Um, and frame um, what you want to show. A different way is if you say, I'm using something that stands for something else. Um, so for instance, here in the middle, uh, you have the pointed head uh, hat that's uh, worn by the king and it becomes the symbol of kingship. So if I want to write king, um, I don't have to deal with maybe different persons in real life that may look differently. I just use this symbol that stands for king. Um, you can also use analogy. For instance, uh, this sign depicted here. If you look at it like this, uh, I'd be interested to know what it means to you or not. Uh, but I think if I give you a little clue, you will see it very nicely. This is the front of a face ending in the nose and you see the eye here. And what they're using the sign for is they want to show front position. Um, and uh, they, they locate it on the body in a way that um, once you know this is the front of the face, you know it's the front being shown. Um, and then uh, they also, of course, uh, uh, use uh, homophony. So for instance, here we have an example of uh, a sign that shows a swings. 
which is called Awiti in Luwian, and uh, that sounds exactly like the verbal form Awiti, he came, and that's what they're using the sign for as well. So there is certainly also a playful element uh, where the scribes uh, enjoy themselves, I would think. Now, if we look at the derivation of phonetic signs, uh, then we know exactly one principle that's at play. We do not know of any other. And I think it's quite likely that it was just this that was used, uh, namely a prophony. So what they're doing is they're using the beginning of a word uh, to derive their sign value from. And the interesting thing is, uh, particularly uh, during the empire period, um, which is the period where quite a few of the signs uh, have developed, uh, they are deriving these values from two languages, from Hittite and from Luwian. And that's also a relatively recent uh, discovery that this has been going on. So we have examples that are clearly coming from Hittite, where we know um, Luwian would use different verbal stems. And we have uh, the majority, I have to say, does come from Luwian. But this very much speaks for a Hittite influence in the development of the script, which again makes a lot of uh, sense if we're locating it in the Hittite empire, in the administrative center, in the capital city, you would have had your scribes that write cuneiform very much in proximity to the scribes that write hieroglyphs. Now, um, when you're writing, you're basically on a uh, continuum that ranges from, you could write purely with logograms to you could just write phonetically. That's kind of the scope uh, where they're at. And um, so traditionally, very early inscriptions start quite heavily on the logographic scale, but they start quite early to, if nothing else, indicate the case ending or verbal ending. So you have a logogram, but um, as here, number two, you add a little bit to show, for instance, here, oh, you want the nominative case, which ends in S. Um, and then, of course, once you start adding some phonetic information, you can give more. And it starts always from the back. So you give another syllable before that, and you might even give the entire word. And then what you could also do is uh, you could then use the semantic sign, even though you no longer need it because you have the full phonetic writing, and it then acts as a classifier guiding you towards the right kind of mental lexicon. Now, for a long time, people thought that what I've shown here along this bar um, is the nature of the development of the script. So you start adding and adding phonetic information until you have everything together, and then you kind of chop off the semantic sign. And it turns out that is not what happens historically in the script. What happens is you add phonetic information, you enlarge on that, and then you think, oh, we don't need these semantic signs. We just write phonetically. And then the latest phase, very majorly, in, excuse me, starts uh, adding uh, semantic information again, which with uh, modern knowledge of how the brain computes writing uh, makes an awful lot of sense because there are actually two pathways through the brain one that deals with semantic information and one that deals with phonetic information. So clearly by a process of trial and error, they found reading functions better when we have both. Now, if we uh, have a quick look again as to what we have and how we get to writing, uh, the very earliest phase, um, but, I mean, it's, it's quite difficult to pinpoint an exact point where you clearly have writing. You clearly have writing by definition at the point where we have phonetic uh, writing, where we can prove here somebody's writing a name phonetically, that is clearly writing. If we only have logographic signs, then we're still at a loss. Is this actually being read? Is it part of a larger system that already exists? Um, or do we deal with two, three signs? And yeah, it could just be um, icons 
communicating with us, but not a fully functioning script. So the earliest that we have that is quite clearly preserved and not writing yet are little marks on pots. Um, a lot of these symbols are connected to later signs of writing, but this is not yet a functioning writing system. Then we start getting stamped seals um, and they have quite a few symbols on there from early periods that are kept also in later periods, for instance, symbols that are supposed to bring good luck, etc. And then you start getting signs that look like logograms and finally you actually get to names being written. Um, and that's the point where we can determine we have a script. Um, at the time when we just have seals, we uh, can actually using just the royal seals because there we know when they date roughly. If we put them together in uh, windows uh, that make sense together, we can tell from that that we actually already have uh, a large uh, sign um, sign list uh, that basically indicates we're having a fully functioning script, even if it's for us visible only in these seals, which of course in their content are limited. Here at the right, we have the seal of a Hittite queen. So along the sides, we have her title. She is the great lady. And in the middle, we have her name, Puduhepa. And what happens then is from this type of writing on seals, the script from what we can tell, from what we can see in the surviving um, documentation, it jumps support. It claims a new medium and uh, namely stone blocks, architectural elements, etc. So here we have one of those early inscribed stone blocks. And if you look at the little graphic uh, on the left at the bottom, you can see actually the kind of uh, layout is not too dissimilar from what we had on the seal where we again move along this uh, middle axis. But actually in terms of reading this, we are now beginning to read in a linear fashion, but we still very much have the center of this block as the center of the graphic design with this very much larger figure of I, the person. You see at the beginning, you have this arrow, that's a demonstrative, this. Then you have something that resembles the stela that uh, you would probably need to be part of their culture to understand that this is what it is. But if you trust me, this is what it is. You have him, I. And then here at the top, you have his name. He's called Taptrami. And here again, this belongs to this sign as well. But here you have this front bit again. Um, so in front, and this is the hand that places. So I placed this dealer in front. Now what we have, and, and it again makes a lot of sense uh, with the type of writing system that we have, we have uh, a very interesting intersection between art and writing. And I've just uh, got two examples here for you. There are quite a few more that also do it in different ways, um, but it's, it's, it's very common to have on the one hand side, pictorial scene that really are predominantly pictorial and they uh, get some information added through hieroglyphs. And then you have the other end of the scope where you have a fully functioning, huge, long inscription. Um, but it begins, as you can see here again, with this figure pointing at himself. Um, so he is actually, this is the first sign of writing of the inscription, but he's fashioned out um, as a fully large, uh, super large, if you want, relief figure. So um, they're exploring these different iconic opportunities that the script gives them. Now, when we're coming to inscriptions, uh, we are now developing a new genre. The inscription I've got here is one of those hammer stones that played such a large role in the discovery. Uh, and, and you see that the format has now changed in contrast to this uh, very short early block, um, which is still very centralized here. We have lines of writing 
and they have a very interesting way of writing. They always start uh, very often top right. Everything okay? Emma, tu as fini tes devoirs? Well, so um, yeah, going back to this, uh, the uh, writing uh, always faces uh, the beginning of the line. You can see it with animal signs and with human body parts, for instance. And at the end of the line, it doesn't go back to the beginning on the same side. It just kind of jumps across and then the next line is read in the opposite direction and so on. This is a style of writing that's called Boustrophodon, as the ox plows. And um, it actually, I think, makes a lot of sense when you consider one of the particular media that are being used. We're thinking of rock faces inscribed like this. And I mean, you don't have to be able to read all of it, but just look at the scale of it. Um, it's again, Hosni, the decipher of Hittite, who's here studying this inscription, and, and you see the massive scale. So if you're reading this inscription, assuming even that your eyesight and the conditions are good enough, and you start at the top right here, and you're walking several meters towards the end of the line, uh, it makes a lot of sense then to turn back reading the next line rather than <laughs> walking all the way uh, and starting again at the same point. So my personal take is that this contributes to them keeping this Bustofenen style of writing. Um, in terms of making the inscriptions readable, um, there are, of course, different guiding lines that help us orientate ourselves. So you've seen already there were lines that are separated often by a drawn line. Within the line, we have a sort of columnar arrangement, often two, three signs above each other. And how do you then orientate yourself? So we have quite a few different marking ways. We have a particular uh, sign that can be used to introduce the beginning of a word. We have several signs that may be used to mark the end of a word. Uh, if they're starting a word using a semantic sign, then they can also mark that with a particular sign. All of these things are optional, but they do get used and they do get used often to a large degree, which is immensely helpful for um, guiding our reading process. So, so these are all of the things that are important when reading. What plays no role whatsoever is how much space there is between signs, um, with the exception of maybe I should say, a word normally begins at the top of a column. It never begins at the bottom, not underneath several other signs. But um, they kind of don't like leaving too much space between signs. I think they found it aesthetically unpleasant. Um, so they often arrange the signs in a slightly disorderly way to avoid having too much space. And another thing that makes no difference whatsoever is the end of a line. A word can very nicely jump across the end of a line. And I've got an example here for you, just, just to give you an impression. Again, you don't have to be able to read it or anything, but here's just one line of text. And if you look at it at the top, um, yeah, how do you know? <laughs> you don't really, it just looks consecutive. And I've broken it up here just to show you for someone who understands the script, we have uh, marked here in lilac, we have these marking signs that indicate something either is a semantic sign, which would then be also at the beginning of a word, or it is actually the beginning of a word or the end of a word. And the semantic signs as well, um, where they stand, and with two exceptions, they always stand at the beginning of the word. So if we know about those, all of a sudden, we can break this up very nicely into individual words. So for the original readers, um, it would have been a lot less messy and disorderly as it may appear to us. 
Now, just to sort of uh, recap that uh, in terms of the development that we have, I mean, we, we have this huge divide between what happens in the Bronze Age and what happened in the Iron Age. These are really, I mean, in, in the cultural context as well, in the Bronze Age, all of this takes place in the Hittite Empire, a huge centralized state with a massive administration. In the Iron Age, um, they're part of quite a few different uh, neo-Hittite states. Um, these states uh, are individual entities and, and they all have quite different uh, shapes as well. So um, we're basically moving from a period of pre-writing where, I mean, I wouldn't even claim that they're using this to aim at writing, but this is culturally the background out of this sign inventory or these drawings that were used at the time, they inform later signs of writing, but, but not all of what's drawn before reappears either. Um, it then moves into a period of very limited writing on seals. And then uh, sort of in the last century of the Hittite empire, we suddenly move on. We have uh, reliefs that are indicated with hieroglyphs. We have graffiti, smaller type things that are being written. And uh, we are very quickly then moving into full inscriptions. And by that time, we certainly have a fully functioning writing system. We quite likely have it before. Um, and then we have a period from which there isn't all that much preserved, but there are some examples from various Neo-Hittite states. And then there, there's really a huge uh, period of about 200 years where the script flourishes, is used widely, um, is explored by the scribe as well as there's a lot of development, for instance, in the use of classifiers. And then around 700 or so, the script disappears little by little. Um, the one part where we really don't know enough is what's the state of private documents. We, we just have a few, we have a few letters, some economic documents, and they all date to the eighth century. So very much at the end of this development. Now, but we already know from the Bronze Age period, uh, we have these signs that advertise for scribes. So clearly, people use their services. And it seems to be very much these few letters that we have, those are chance finds on lead. Uh, and normally we would expect that not to survive either. Um, on that basis, that's probably a development that starts much, 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 much earlier. We just don't have it. And that very much brings us towards the end of our talk for tonight. It's uh, thankfully not the end of the story. And I just wanted to show you this. This is the Yerkapa tunnel. Um, it's sort of a huge tunnel that goes underneath the fortifications of the Hittite capital at Hattusha. Um, it's been there, I mean, clearly since Hittite times, but archaeologists have known this tunnel for a long time too. And last uh, <laughs> summer they discovered it's full of hieroglyphic writing. It's just a bit dark and nobody's really ever looked that closely at it. So they found uh, close to 250 signs of writing in here. Quite a few repeat themselves as well, but um, so there's lots of little groups of writing within this tunnel, um, probably Apotopraic, we're still waiting to have the full publication of this. But so the story of the hieroglyphic script uh, and in terms of rediscovering who used it where and for what uh, stays exciting. Now to just uh, sum up a little bit. So what, what do we have uh, during the Bronze Age in terms of writing? And now as promised, I, I will use the words rise and fall. Um, so uh, we do have cuneiform writing on clay tablets, and, and that's very much all of the administrative work, um, but uh, literary text, there's quite a bit more historiography, etc. Uh, and we have that from about 1800 to 1200 BC. And that falls with the fall of the Hittite administration. We have no Hittite clay tablets after that period. 
Now, the hieroglyphic script um, comes in a little bit later than cuneiform. It comes in slowly at first with just sort of names and titles, both on seals and reliefs. And then, and, and this can be very much connected to a, if you want, monumental turn in art and architecture. All of a sudden, they've got these huge building projects and everything's monumental. And for whatever reason they decide it needs to be inscribed and they're not doing it with cuneiform they're doing it with this hieroglyphic script as i said the unknown component is on what did they write other things we're quite certain they would have had letters and economic documents etc uh, even legal documents we don't have what we would expect uh, now, um, that clearly took place on some kind of material, be it wooden tablets or something else, lead strips maybe. Um, so we don't know, we cannot judge what script they used. Now we're moving uh, out of the bronze into the Iron Age. And just again, to give you a very brief overview here, um, these are the Neo-Hittite states, and you see, firstly, there's quite a few of them, and um, just to explain this uh, somewhat confusing, colorful <laughs> marking system, I'm trying to show here uh, which languages um, and scripts are preserved from these areas. So we have Aramean-speaking and Luwin-speaking areas, and we have areas where we have both which also means uh, inscriptions in both languages and scripts from there. So you, you see, this is an area where a lot is going on. Uh, all of them somehow uh, continue enough elements that are in the tradition of the Hittite empire. So not just language script, but also for instance, architecture and art uh, to be considered Neo-Hittite, but it's uh, by no means uh, homogenous. And uh, so what happens in this period, uh, we have a period where the script really flourishes across these different entities. Um, so that's 10th, late 10th to the 8th century BC. Um, and then little by little, a lot of these uh, various Neo-Hittite states, not every single one, but quite a few of them, are conquered by the Assyrian Empire, that sort of the second half of the eighth century. Now, with the end of independent rule, very much comes the fact that the local rulers are deposed. So the local rulers no longer display themselves by using the script. Um, that seems to be one aspect why the script disappears. The other one is, of course, it is not alone on the scene. It's in competition against both alphabetic writing. We have uh, quite a few different systems around, but alphabetic writing obviously has the huge advantage that it's much, much easier to learn, far fewer signs, etc. You don't need a scribal culture. You can actually possibly learn this as a normal individual. And then on the other hand, cuneiform is again coming into this area from particularly the Assyrian Empire, but other um, states like Urartu also use it. So cuneiform, while still a scribal script, um, has the advantage. It's actually widely used. It's more international. The Anatolian hieroglyphs very much is a prestige project, maybe that calls back a glorious past of the Hittite Empire but here it falls. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Annick. Uh, alors maintenant, nous avons un moment pour les questions, uh, que ce soit en français ou en anglais. J'en vois une immédiatement dans le chat uh, de AG. I am researching the possible relationship of the name Teria with other Indo-European place names and people. Do you have any insights into lines of investigation in this regard that you could offer? So Ngan Castial says many thanks. Um, further questions? to treat in question, any influence by Egyptian hieroglyphs? Question mark. 
Yes, I would say it's unlikely, except for possible, uh, possibly the uh, inspiration of pictorial writing being a fine thing to do. We know that during the period where the script really develops in the Hittite Empire, they had diplomatic ties to Egypt. Egypt. So there would have been Hittites that traveled there and probably came back and told off all the amazing things they saw in Egypt. So, but other than an impetus for maybe uh, connecting hieroglyphic writing with prestige and, and I mean, Egypt was a major player at a time where the Hittite empire only wanted to become one. Um, there are really no great structural parallels, um, so it's it's clearly been developed uh, within Anatolia and not uh, with the help of somebody who wrote Egyptian. Also, I would personally argue that um, there are quite a few similarities structurally to cuneiform. I personally am convinced, even though I cannot prove that, uh, because we, we we have no stories that tell about the beginning of the script. We we can only piece it together from the evidence of the writing that survives. Um, but I am of the opinion that uh, the script was certainly developed within the scribal circles of Hattusha by scribes that knew Hittite cuneiform. So um, I, I really see the origins there. And to another question that is uh, connected, Yen Singletary, do you have any thoughts on why these two scripts, hieroglyphs and cuneiform, were used simultaneously in Hittite Anatolia? It's a very good question because, of course, it seems uh, a little bit extravagant to use two writing systems. Um, I, I would imagine it's a question of uh, prestige, and uh, so we really see the explosion uh, of the hieroglyphic script onto the scene with this uh, confidence uh, of being suddenly an important empire. Uh, it's very much the last Hittite kings, Tuthalia IV and uh, Supiruliuma II, who... Um, make these monuments and want to inscribe them. And uh, so what, the question really that we should ask is why did they not use cuneiform to inscribe monuments? Other Near Eastern people had no problem. They used cuneiform on clay tablets and they inscribed monuments with it. And I think what they wanted to do is they wanted to show we are somehow special. We have this a uh, hieroglyphic script. Possibly we're as special as the Egyptians, although we don't know that. Um, but I think it's a prestige project. It's, uh, if I might just add to an extent, it's, it's also a similar situation with Meroitic writing, where it starts not as a hieroglyphic writing system, but at some point they also want to have a hieroglyphic writing system. Because, well, it's good to have one. Okay. Uh, Two more questions from Gan Kosyol. Was there any Hittite letter found in Amarna or any writing on perishable material found in Egyptian dry climate? Yes, we have correspondence between Egypt and the Hittite Empire from Egypt. Um, but what the Hittites do is they do not write in Hittite to the Egyptians. They write in Akkadian because that was at the time the lingua franca. Um, but that's how the very earliest researchers found out that there was a Hittite empire, not just these uh, unimportant tribes that we have in the Bible. So that's really where the interest into ooh, who were the Hittites and where were the Hittites started with the discovery of the Amarna archives. We do not have anything on other material then clay tablets, I think. And another question by Yen Singletary, which addresses the topic that I know, Anik, you have been working on for many years now. Since some of the hieroglyphs are self-explanatory, such as the ego logogram, do you think illiterate viewers could understand these monuments more readily? Um, yes, that is, of course, uh, a slightly tricky question. Um, I think we should answer yes and no. Uh, the one thing that they clearly cannot do is they cannot stand in front of a long inscription and uh, magically understand the content. But what they can do is they can understand individual signs. Um, 
for instance, this sign pointing at himself, um, easy enough to understand. They might even be trained to understand, for instance, the spelling of their city or of their king uh, or of particular deities. Um, I think that's quite likely, just as something that can be transmitted in stories. Oh, look, this is the storm god. And every time we see him, he's there with this wavy line that actually is supposed to be uh, lightning so that way they understand this symbolizes that but um, clearly I think uh, illiterate uh, viewers are not readers in this sense but they're readers they're consumers they're communicators in a different sense they're part of the audience uh, and it's at our peril that we ignore them they're also part of this. And I think also the scribe was well aware of having these two registers that are both part of the script. So obviously he doesn't start writing things that are silly text, so it looks pretty and can be understood without being writing. That doesn't happen. But I think he explores along the lines of I'm writing a text that is actually using a writing system and is uh, fully developed as a textual artifact but within that I'm playing with things that are visually attractive that are visually potent for someone who cannot read because virtually everyone who passes by cannot read this. That makes me think of a comment uh, by Stefan Hausen, the, the Mayanist, a student of another of these great hieroglyphic traditions of writer writing with the Mayas and he wrote that uh, hieroglyphic writing systems in general tend to be at once exclusionary and inviting. So it's the two things simultaneously, they exclude and at the same time they invite. Um, so from Gonzalo Rojas Oberreuter, thank you for your presentation. Do you think there was some magic, magic in inverted commas, dimension involved in the act of reading in the Hittite culture? Um. I would approach this question from a slightly different angle. I think there was something magic in inverted commas involved in the act of writing. I think writing as marking a place as a particular sacred zone, as a way of uh, dealing with the liminality of particular places in particular we have writing often at places where uh, we know they consider these were zones where you could communicate with the underworld um, so for instance where springs uh, come out of the ground um, those were typical places of that type um, but also near rivers and so on uh, we find uh, writing and I think that writing, while it's often uh, not necessarily related in content to this liminal space, I think the mere existence of it in these places played a role in dealing with the, well, how, how do we want to call it, the potentially dangerous and certainly, uh, yeah, powerful place. I see no other questions, so... Let us think, uh, Annick Begin, again, uh, commentary by Jens Singletary. Many thanks for this fascinating lecture and also your answers to my questions and claps. So thank you very much, Annick. Um, now for the next instantiation of the series, uh, I switch back to French. Uh, nous nous retrouvons donc dans 13 jours, 13 et non 14, le mercredi et non le jeudi, exceptionnellement, 5 avril pour une présentation de Pierre Marson, intitulée « Entre monde altaïque et monde chinois, les écritures chitanes ». Après l'écriture Tangout, que nous avons vue il y a deux semaines avec Guillaume Jacques, nous poursuivrons ainsi, après l'exploration des écritures des formations politiques aux marches septentrionales de l'Empire chinois. D'ici là, bonne soirée à tous.